Amen. Victory. So we're going to talk today about uh, our hope in Jesus. And, and hope is one of those interesting words, isn't it? That um, we use in a lot of ways to mean a lot of things. <laughs> um, it's a Bible word, it ha- it's a purposeful word, and yet uh, I think a lot of times it's lost some of its power. Um, we, we might say things like pulling in to church. Are they going to have food today? I hope so. Or we might say, you think pastor will get done on time today? I hope so. And, and what we really mean is I kind of wish or think or, you know, kind of maybe it will and maybe it won't, right? Are we going to win the game? Are we, we going to have a good dinner? Or are we going to get there on time? Are we going to run out of gas? And, and we use this, oh, I hope so, uh, pretty lightly, right? Sometimes we use it uh, for things that we, we quite honestly think won't happen, right? Are we actually going to eat dinner today at 4 p.m.? I hope so. It's never happened before, but it might today. <laughs> we, we might use it for things that we think could happen, like you think there will be any dinner rolls left after my nephew's strike? Probably not, but I hope so. We use it for things that we are pretty sure will happen, like you think the food's going to be good? I hope so, but we kind of know it's always good. And, and we even use it in areas that we're really, really confident of, like do you think the table's going to hold up? Do you think the chairs will hold us up? Do you think the car will start? I hope so, which we really feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm quite certain those things are not going to fail. And yet here's the problem with kind of our human understanding of hope is sometimes things don't work out. Sometimes that car that starts every day all of a sudden has a dead battery. It, we had no reason to doubt it. Sometimes those tires that always hold air weren't holding air anymore. And sometimes the person that we thought we could count on didn't show up. You ever have that happen? I mean, we're all used to people that we don't really count on letting us down, but then there's people that we really count on. Maybe it's your parents, maybe it's your grandparents, maybe it's your best friend, maybe it's your spouse, and you're like, most people let me down, but I, I can always count on them. And then every once in a while, even the people you really count on, it's not because they're mean and it's not because they wanted to, but because they're called human beings. Come on. Before we get too frustrated, how about, I bet at least once in your life you've let someone down. But here is the problem when we, when we think about hope in terms of dinner and hope in terms of, of who's going to win the ball game and, and hope in terms of, of what time are we going to get out of church today. We, we think of that word as something that's pretty fragile and likely to be disappointed. And here's one of the problems, I think, that interferes with our relationship with God. See, God created you and I. Jesus was a human born on planet Earth, but he has been resurrected, and he is now in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. And and we still take human attributes, and we try to apply them to God. That's the problem. People fail us. People forget. People don't come on time. People let me down, and we tend to think, well, when's that going to happen with God? But see, God is different. (laughs) See, God is perfect. God never fails. God never forgets. God knows you. God is with you. God loves you. And when we try to think of God in human terms, we are applying constraints on God that he far exceeds. He's perfect. And it, it applies to this word hope because even if the, the most trusted person, we, we hope they'll come through for us, they just might fail. But see, with God, he never fails. With God, he never forgets. With God, he never is selfish. He's never judgmental. He's never critical. He's never angry. He loves us. 
And so hope for the believer is a little bit different. See, hope is an expectation that things are going to happen like I would like them to happen. And a lot of time, hope works out. But see, hope for the believer is based on God, not on anyone else. And that means it's always going to work. It's an expectation. See, Hebrews talks about these connects hope to faith. Hebrews 11 says faith is, is the substance or the evidence of things hoped for. It is the, the evidence of things not seen. It's the proof. Faith, we have faith in God because we know what we hope for will happen. We know what he promised will happen. We know that he will not fail. And so instead of hoping like I wish it will happen, hope leads to an absolute confidence in faith. Our hope in Christ. And so I want to talk about that hope, but I want you to get your head in the right place today. That, that when I'm talking about our hope in Jesus, it's not like, well, maybe he will and maybe he won't. Our hope in Jesus is he'll do what he said he would do. He will never fail. We do sometimes, but God never fails. So we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 1 today. And I think these couple verses, 1 Peter 1, 3 to 5, they carry a lot of substance in three little verses. And it says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last days. A living hope. So our hope in Jesus, I'm just going to give you three. We're going to keep it pretty simple today because we got lunch plans. No? All right, I'll keep I could I got more. <laughs> I no problem. Nobody's got lunch plans today. I do. <laughs> but in this text, there's really it kind of talks about three kinds of hope related to Jesus. And the first one is this a living hope. A living hope. This is really important to me. It said right in that scripture, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He caused us to be born again into a living hope. According to his great mercy, mercy is a wonderful thing. Mercy means when I deserve something, and we have parents that loved you so much that they occasionally disciplined you. (laughs) Right? Mercy is when you deserved it. You deserved it and, and, and God took the punishment for you. Because of his great mercy, he withheld the punishment that we deserve. Ephesians says, uh, because of his great love for us, Ephesians 2, 4, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, so his great love led to his great mercy, made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. So it's that picture of resurrection, right? When Jesus was dead in the tomb and God raised him from the dead, Ephesians said it was his great love, that made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. A living hope. A living hope is pretty important to me because we don't, we don't worship a, a book. We believe the Bible is the written word of God, but we serve a living Savior. He's alive. We serve a Savior who we can talk to and who listens to us, who knows us. We serve a Savior who lived on planet Earth and understands what it is to struggle, what it, what it means to be uh, misunderstood, what it means to be lonely, what it means to be hungry, what it means to be uh, in trouble, what it means to be uh, misrepresented, misunderstood, what it means to suffer, what it means to be tempted. And I'm glad I have a Savior that I can talk to. I remember in and I, you might be surprised, but truthfully, I'm, I'm an introvert. I, 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 don't, I not only don't mind quiet time, I rather enjoy it. But I remember in, in that wonderful season we had called 2020. Remember that? How many of you just wiped it from your mind? <laughs> and I remember thinking, this is no big deal because I like being alone. That was good for like three days. 
And the introvert was like, I need to see people. I, did, I figured out that we weren't meant to be alone. Now, some, now, if you've met my darling wife, she is an extrovert, so she knows all of you and all of your names and all of your pets' names and all of your kids' names. and She knows the lady at the grocery store's name and all of their kids' names. And but I still recognize, you know what, I actually like to talk to people and visit people and see people and hug people and be around people. And, and Jesus is that person that's not just a, a figure in a book or not just a, a cross we look at, an empty cross, but he is a living person, the Son of God, who is a risen Savior, a living hope. New birth into a living hope. John 20 kind of chronicles the Mary Magdalene and others went to the tomb and they, and they find that it's empty and they see some, some angels that they think are gardeners, and, but they find, what do they find? Grave clothes are empty, the, the, the cloths are folded, there's no, the stone is rolled away, and they find that Jesus is risen. And he, he wasn't stolen. He wasn't hidden. He rose from the dead and walked out of that tomb. And and he was seen by many for the next 40 days, and then he ascended into heaven, a living, risen Savior. You know, there's a lot of uh, new technology. If you're a a techie, um, it's it's amazing what you can learn. There there are good, there are bad things on the Internet, but there, you, we have amazing access to information that is unprecedented in the world, right? Artificial, it's not just Google anymore. Now it's artificial intelligence uh, inspired search engines that, that can have some an intelligent working as they search things for you. It's quite amazing. But, but what they can get you, what the greatest computers on planet Earth can get you is information. But that's not a living person. They don't care about you. They don't know you. They can't. Now, they can fake it. If you've been talking to an AI, then wake up. <laughs> it's a fake computer, right? It's, it's not somebody who knows you, who cares about you, who loves you, and who can respond to you. It's purely information. But we don't serve just a God in heaven who knows everything. We serve a God in heaven who knows you, who wants to spend time with you, I love the story in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve, I don't like when they failed, but what I like is right after they failed, you know what God did? He shows up in the garden the next day to see them. Now, they were hiding and they were embarrassed, but what was God's response? These are my kids. I want to see them. A living father wants to spend time in a living relationship. It gets even more exciting. Our living Savior gives way to a future hope. So we have a living hope and we have a future hope. Verse 4 said this. So he gave us this living hope to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. An eternal hope, a future hope. It's amazing. He said imperishable. That means it's not going to die. It's not going to go away. Heaven's not going to vanish. It, 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 but he goes even further. He said it's undefiled. There is no sin. There is no death. There is no contamination in heaven. But he even goes further. It's unfaded. It's not going to deteriorate. It's not going to decline. It's not going to, like most things, come on, it's not going to get worse with time. It's not going to decline with time. But heaven is perfect, reserved for us. Isn't that amazing? An inheritance. Some of you are going to get an inheritance, a closet full of things that at one time were valuable. (laughs) Come on. But most things in life deteriorate. Last winter, I wanted to go skiing, and um, I don't want to say I'm cheap. That wouldn't sound good, so I'm frugal. And being frugal, I didn't want to pay for renting skis and stuff. And I thought, I knew that my parents, a long time ago, years ago, decades ago, 
had done a lot of skiing, and I knew there were some skis somewhere at their house. And so I thought if I could find those skis, I wouldn't have to rent any. So I go and make a search, and, and it had been decades, and, and they were uh, old, and they were in storage, and they had been sitting a long time. But I, miracle of miracles, I found them, right? Speaking of inheritance, my father left me. He's still alive. Left for me these wonderful skis. And uh, I tried them on. They fit. I mean, kind of fit. They fit for a frugal, cheap person, right? I could fit my foot in them. And so I got these skis, and I go skiing. And, and so I took one of my daughters. I won't say which one. And, uh, and we're skiing. We're having a good time. And, and, and I'm just going to be honest. I've skied before. I like to ski. And I was feeling pretty good about myself and my free skis. And I was having a good time. And you know what the Bible says something about pride comes before the... So I was kind of feeling really good about how good I was. And, and I'm skiing along, and it's a sunny day, and it's snow, and, and all of a sudden, boom, in the face plant. And I thought, huh. That's what I thought. Huh. And I thought, I, I'm a pretty good skier. I don't know why I fell. And I, and I thought, I must have hit something, and I'm looking around, and there's nothing there. It's just the side of the hill. And I thought, huh. So I did what you do when you're skiing. You can, it was a pretty steep hill, so I had to kind of slide your feet down and get your skis kind of straightened up so you can put your boots back in the skis. And I go to put my boot back in the ski, and I look down, and all I see is, is my sock. Well, that's, I mean, the, the part that straps around your ankle was there, but the bottom of the boot was gone, and the whole toe was gone. And it was just my sock. The whole boot had exploded. It was dry rotted. It was junk. My wonderful free gift left me near the top of the mountain in my sock. Now, I did consider skiing down on one ski, and I just kind of knew how that would end. So I packed up my skis and walked <laughs> down the hill in my sock and uh, begged the people to give me, let me use some boots. Um, but I was reminded that, that stuff deteriorates. But God promises us an inheritance that never fades, never spoils, is never tarnished, never goes away. We can count on it being there. You know, there's a, a little book I like. It's called Heaven by Randy Alcorn. He says, what won't be in heaven? He said, there's no death, there's no suffering, no funeral homes, abortion clinics, psychiatric wards. No rape or missing children or drug rehabilitation centers. No bigotry or muggings or killings or worry or depression or economic downturns. No wars or unemployment or anguish over failure and miscommunication. No con men, no locks, no death, no mourning, no pain, no boredom, no arthritis, no handicap parking, no cancer, no taxes, no bills, hallelujah, no computer crashes, no weeds, no bombs, no traffic jams, accidents, septic tank backups, mental illness, or unwanted emails. <laughs> there will be close friendships, but not cliques. Laughter, but no put-downs. Intimacy, but no temptation to immorality. No hidden agendas or backroom deals or betrayals. Imagine a mealtime full of stories, laughter, and joy without the fear of insensitivity, inappropriate behavior, anger, gossip, lust, jealousy, hurt feelings, or any other thing that would eclipse our joy. That will be heaven. There won't be churches or temples in the new universe, not because they're bad, just because they're not necessary. We won't need to draw into God's presence. We'll live there constantly and consciously. We'll thank God profoundly and worship and praise him together. In heaven, now this is a book, I didn't make this up. He said there will likely be coffee. No reason to think there won't be coffee trees on the new earth. Jesus said, blessed are you who hunger and thirst now, for you will be satisfied. <laughs> but I can promise you this. Heaven is a wonderful place. It is our future hope. And I use hope in the sense of a believer, which means it is a confident expectation that if God said this is truth, we can trust him. So we have a living hope a Savior who identifies and who communicates and, and who knows us. We have a future hope that uh, one day when this life is over and uh, we are called home to glory, there is a glory to go to. There is a place that is amazing prepared for us. 
And you know, if God stopped there, if Jesus stopped there, wouldn't that be pretty good? I think that's quite good. Can I just be honest and say, I don't think Jesus, well, he didn't owe us that. That's why it's called grace. But he certainly doesn't owe us help in this present life where we've kind of made a mess of things. And yet, because he loves us, because of his grace, because of his goodness, listen to what it says. We've read verse 4, an inheritance. It says, kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last days. So there, he says, I am going to keep you. I am going to protect you. I am going to watch over you. In John 10.10, 10, it says, the thief... The enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus said something. He said, I came to give you life now, life and life more abundantly. In other words, Jesus said, I want to be involved in life now. And the life you have now should be an abundant life. Peter said, through this faith, you are shielded by God's power. Now, who, who, who gets shielded? Who gets protected? Who gets blessed. Well, this is some deep study here. I mean, deep, deep. Rhonda, you're a professor. I'm, you check me on this, okay? Professor Rhonda is going to check me on this. One word before verse 5, where it says, who by God's power, it says, you. So it says, kept in heaven for you, who by faith. So I'm pretty sure, Rhonda, that the who is you. Come on, look at somebody next to you and say, the who is you. The who who gets abundant life, the who who gets kept by God, the who who gets cared for by God is you. He's with you. He loves you. And his promises are for you. Isn't that good news? A current hope. It's a military word. It, it's when a, a, a guard would, would protect and, and keep safe something. He's saying God is keeping you until he returns. He is watching over you. He is with you. He is your ever-present helper. It's amazing. Now here's the question I have today that I think it's important that we answer. These three types of hope are a living hope, a future hope, and a current hope. Who gets access to that? Because we know, as I started the sermon today, that most of the time when we think about hope, it's just a worldly hope. Like we're just wishful thinking. So who gets the privilege of moving from wishful thinking into confident faith? When in doubt, look in the book. So where we started at was this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. And it goes on into a inheritance that will not fade and to be kept and protected. So... What's the key word there? By his mercy, by his love, he caused us to be, isn't that kind of a churchy word? Born again. It's a, it is. It is a churchy word because we don't use that anywhere else. In no other context we talk about being born again. But Jesus used that word. He started it with this guy named Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he's asking him about the kingdom and and. and he said, he's kind of uh, really affirming Jesus, saying, hey, I know you're a great teacher, and no one could do what you do unless you came from God. And, and Jesus said, all right, let's just cut to the chase, Nicodemus. It's not about teaching, and it's not about miracles. It's about you. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. So Jesus uses that word, or those two words, born again. How can a man be born again when he's old, said Nicodemus. Good question. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom unless he's born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, the spirit 
gives birth to the Spirit. So what Jesus is saying is, number one, you've got to be born once to enter the human race, but you've got to be born again, spiritual rebirth, to enter the kingdom of God. So there's a human birth and a spiritual birth. Oh. And what Peter said was that we are born again into that living hope, into that future hope. So who gets to move from wishful thinking into confident expectation? Those that have accepted God's grace and been born again. That could be you. For most of you, that is you. And you know, that's not an automatic. I think here is something I learned. Um, you know, when you get a phone, when you get a computer, when you get a tablet, anything electronic, it has default settings, right? This is 2024 and nobody, well, I shouldn't say nobody. Some of you still struggle turning on your phone. But if you're under 30, you don't live with default settings, right? You, you customize your ringers and your images and how the thing operates. But there is a default mode. Hang with me. We operate, unfortunately, on the assumption that as human beings, our default mode is going to heaven. Our default mode is forgiven. Our default mode is adopted by God. And unfortunately, that's not the case, right? We, Adam and Eve sinned. We were born into a sinful nature. And we have, because of that cross, because of Jesus' death and his resurrection, we have the opportunity to be born again instead of in that sinful nature into the image of God, into the family of God, and into his grace. But it is a decision that we make. If we keep default mode, we're in trouble. We have to make that choice. I want to know Jesus. It's more than being a church attender. It's more than owning a Bible or even reading the Bible. It's more than even believing. It's saying, yes, I want to know Jesus in a personal way. It's saying, I want to be in relationship with Jesus. He is the living hope and the living Savior, so we should have a relationship with him. That's what it means to be born again. If Sometimes I've asked people, uh, are you a Christian? Have you been born again? They'd say, oh, yeah, I've always been a Christian. And I'll say, I'm not sure about that. Have you made a decision? Well, I grew up in church. Good. That's a good place to grow up. But have you made a decision to know Jesus? Yeah, Grandma prayed for me all the time. She's amazing. Praise God for praying grandmas. But have you made a decision to enter a relationship with the living Savior? So in a couple minutes, I want to pray for you. I'm going to ask Jordan to come on up, and we're just going to have some music just for a minute. I'm going to get you out early, those of you that hope so. Of course, it's not done yet, but I'm, I'm feeling pretty confident right now. In a couple minutes, we're going to just pray for needs. I believe God wants to bring victory today. But I want you to just take a minute and ask an honest question. And it's not overly complicated, although we don't always like the answer. But just be honest with yourself. Have I been born again in the spiritual sense? Have I made the decision to start a relationship with Jesus? If I was three or four or five years old or seven, I think little kids can, can on their level understand that. But it's a decision. I recognize I need Jesus, and I'm inviting him into my life. Have I made the decision to be born again? Because Jesus started, right? He he's took the first step by going to the cross, by rising again, and by making himself available. And now kind of the ball's in our court to say, yes, I received that. Yes, I want to be adopted into God's family. Yes, I want my sins forgiven. And yes, I want a relationship with Jesus. So I want to ask you to bow your heads this morning. And um, I want to respect you this morning. But I want to also give you the opportunity to start a relationship with the living Savior today. If you're here, you're watching online, and you just say, 
Pastor, today I'd like to pray that prayer. I'd like to make that decision to start a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've, you've been to church a lot, and that's great. Praise God. Keep going. But as far as relationship, you'd say, today I want to start. Anybody just, would you just raise your hand and say, today I'd like to, to make that prayer. I'd like to make that decision. I'd like to start that relationship. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? It's okay. Guess what? I was in your seat once. <laughs> Everyone in this room, or most people in this room, have been in a seat faced with a decision. And I can tell you, I've made a few decisions in my life that I've regretted, but this is not one of them. <laughs> I've never met a believer who said, boy, I wish I didn't do that. Never. Anybody else this morning? God's stirring your heart. Amen. Church, can we pray? And I want to invite especially those that raised your hand, but let's all pray together because I think it's good to just repeat our, our, dec our, our commitment to Christ. Would you pray out loud with me and say, Have, thank you, Jesus, for loving me. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life as a sacrifice for my sins. Today, I surrender. I invite you, Jesus, into my life to be my Lord my Savior, I surrender. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Isn't God good? Amen. Some of you might be saying, huh, I don't feel anything. And some of you might, oh, I just felt something. It's not really about what you feel or don't feel. It's about saying, yes, Jesus. But what you're going to find out is that's the start of a relationship that's quite amazing. Now listen, before I send you home today, I just want to pray over you. I started this morning by saying, talking about victory. The cross was all about the innocent Lamb of God, Jesus, shedding his blood for your sins forgiven. But with that, in addition to that, the scripture says, by his wounds, Jesus... We are healed. We talk, the scriptures talk about freedom. He who the sun sets free is free indeed. The scriptures talk about he provides for all of our needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And so I want to just take a, a minute before we go home today. And if you're here and you say, I need victory. Maybe it's, it's a new job. Maybe it's in a relationship. Maybe it's over sin or addiction or a stronghold. Maybe... It, it's just a decision you need to make. Maybe you're stuck in an area of life and you just need a breakthrough. Maybe there is sin and you're saying, today I want to I be free from that, that draw, that, that habit, that behavior. But if you need victory today, would you just wave at me? I want to pray for you as we go today. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Can we pray and agree together? You know, I like to say this, by the way, that you can, you can borrow it, but I, I say this often. I, I'm one of God's favorites, and I am, but you are too, so that's why you can steal it. But I am one of God's favorites, and he takes care of me. Right? I'm one of his kids. I have four wonderful kids. Actually, they're all here today. That's pretty fun for me, and a wonderful granddaughter. And if I can help them, if I can do something, I'd, I'd do as much as I can, right? Any parents say, but I'm a human being, and every once in a while, there's something I can't do or don't do. I got grumpy the other day doing something. Anyway, God's not, God's not me. Aren't you glad? God loves you with perfection, and his resources are without end. And if me as a human father wants to do the best I can to help my kids, you better believe your heavenly father wants to be involved in your life and he is able to do exceeding abundantly what you can even think or ask or imagine. Amen. So let's pray. Lord, thank you that you love us and that you're faithful and that you're able. <laughs> there is nothing. Matter of fact, scripture says there's nothing that you cannot do. So we're in agreement today that by your wounds, by your 
stripes, by the blood shed on Calvary, our bodies are healed. We decree that over this room and over those watching today, that, that broken bodies, that things that are worn out, things that are inflamed, things that are in pain, things that are, that are destroyed, ruined, fatigued, we call you back into wholeness and health and restoration in Jesus' name. We speak over marriages, over relationships, over parents and children, even, even this weekend as we gather and as we talk, Lord, that there's healing in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you that you're the provider. You provided on the cross, you provided through your resurrection, and you provide in, in practical ways all that we need according to your glorious riches. And we're in agreement today, whether that's a job or resource or wisdom or direction, that today you, you're our provider. You're our protector. We, we talked about that in Peter today. You keep us. You watch over us. And we release your favor and your protection today. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, I'm just asking for your presence to saturate our lives today, that we would know, not just in our head academically, but we would know in our heart and in our spirit, your, your presence, your companionship, your leading, your help, that you go with us. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, as we go today, may we represent you, may, your, may we carry your presence into family dinners and into the places we visit and into businesses, and may we... Uh, Take that presence and that love where we go. And we're thankful today. We are thankful for victory. We're thankful for the cross. We're thankful for your love. And we're thankful for the resurrection power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, two things. I know you thought I was done. I am. I am. I'm just going to bless you. But we have prayer teams that are going to be available at the front here. If there's something additionally we could pray for, we would love to take a minute and pray for you. Uh, but be safe, be blessed today, and may you go in God's grace. Amen.